Um, good afternoon, all. Thank you for joining us for this live webinar. I'm James, Managing Director at Vertex Growth and Partnerships. Very pleased to have with us today our guest speakers from Gig Plus, the leading logistics, automation, and robotics technology provider, and also a portfolio company of Vertex to share with us their insights on how warehouse automation innovation is transforming and driving supply chain operations. Introducing Lit Fong is uh, the Vice President and Managing Director of uh, Overseas Business for Geek Plus, and uh, Elvin Yap, the Sales Director of, uh, for Southeast Asia. Also honored to have seasoned industry practitioners here to share regional perspectives at our fireside chat later. Introducing uh, Mr. Kato San, founder and CEO of uh, ACCA International, one of the most advanced 3PL companies based in Tokyo, and uh, the logistics arm of uh, Daiwa House Group. And uh, Ryan, Head of Growth at YCH Singapore Company. Before I hand over the baton, uh, allow me to briefly introduce Vertex. Uh, Vertex was established in 1988. Vertex Holdings is a Singapore-based venture capital firm that provides anchor funding and operational support to a proprietary global network of cap uh, venture capital funds. Today, we have six network funds with over 90 professionals worldwide. We are a proud investor of over 200 companies with an AUM of over 3.6 billion US dollars. Through our network of funds, our localized and domain specialized teams invest in the best technology and healthcare opportunities across US, Israel, China, India, and Southeast Asia. With funds focusing both at early and growth stage, our close partnership with Tomasic as well, we're able to fund and support promising companies across their life cycle. And on this slide, just a brief uh, example of some of the portfolio companies that we have invested in, um, in the key trans trans transformative uh, technology verticals. Inter interconnected globally, our network actively value creates for our portfolio by supporting their global scaling plans. The partnership group is a dedicated team that focuses on this mandate. This webinar is an example of the work uh, in bringing innovation communities together and creating opportunities for collaboration for everyone. And uh, with that, uh, some administrative instructions. Uh, there is a QA button below where you can type out your questions. Feel free to post your questions, and uh, we shall have a QA session uh, right after the fire side chat uh, segment. And with that, I shall hand over the floor now to Lit, MD of Overseas Business and Big Plus. Over to you, Lit. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, James. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Lit Fong, Managing Director of Git Plus. Um, first, firstly, I would like to take this chance to thank uh, Vertex uh, for their support and also our honor to having Vertex holding as our investor last year. Okay, so maybe I start the, uh, the um, Git Plus introduction first and then I will hand over to Alvin to intro introduce more our application and our product. So you can see the, this is the milestone of, our, uh, of Git Plus and then we found it in 2014 and then uh, for, for the uh, fundraising rise, we, we, we've got uh, the first angel round funding in 2015, which is around um, 10 million RMB. And in final round in, in last year, we, we've got uh, 150 million US dollar uh, Series C funding. So this is um, uh, this funding money is um, support us to grow very fast and replicate in globally. So this is very useful for us as well. And then we develop different type of system. You can see um, the, the green light, uh, we, we start from picking system. This is more on traditional uh, goods to person solution. And then we keep it on to getting this um, different type of certificate, this legacy certificate and different country certificate to, for the product to, to emphasize the, the product and reach the, the functionality for every country. And also we, uh, we start from um, uh, uh, China, based in China, headquarters in China, and then we start a different um, uh, branch office like um, in Japan office, we have a Hong Kong office as well. Uh, in last year, we set up Singapore office, uh, German office and UK office. And in, and in this year, we also set up the North American uh, office in, in uh, San Diego. So, and also we, we cover most of the country in the world. 
um, we have some partner in like uh, Australia and also we've got a, um, a, a project in South America this year. Um, so we cover most of the country. So um, we we tend to um, to 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 go into the market for for uh, all the area um, in in the world. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so there's a, you can see there's a series of the, uh, our full series of our robot family. And then uh, I would like Alvin to help me to, to help us to, to introduce the whole uh, portal line uh, and also the application. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, well, thank you everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join our webinar. Thank you, Lit. thank you, James. Um, as shared earlier, um, now on the screen, we have the first poll. And I hope you can take probably about 10, 15 seconds of your time to, you know, to share uh, what are some of your pain points in automating operations. And in about 15 seconds time, we will show the results. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the most important and most concerned for everyone is actually the cost implementation and maintaining. I'm sure about, uh, about the ROI and then following which is the integration of existing systems and tools. Um, well, the good news is that probably in my presentation later, which is going to have uh, probably very little words, quite a couple of videos and uh, concentrating on the applications. There will also be a section to talk about the ROI, so that will cater for maybe fifty-nine percent of you guys, of um, of the audience here. The whole suite of Git Plus products uh, involves uh, from picking to moving all the way to a smart factory and a smart warehouse. So basically, the robotic can actually be used in all these cases. So going on to our first one, which is our picking model. Now, in this picking model, some of the customers that actually uses this, uh, um, let's say, uh, fashion, apparel. Apple companies like uh, uh, Decathlon, then we have uh, even uh, for 3PLs, big local players like uh, YCH, whom we have uh, as a speaker today. We are also using uh, in, in China, in, for example, Nike. So these are some of the different uh, customers that we have. This is a goods to person picking system that uses our picking robots. And what it does is that it totally encompasses the principle of having the goods totally move to the person. Uh, this is very good for a very high throughput requirement, which is for order fulfillment. So typical industries would be e-commerce, which is one of the buzzword or let's say a bus uh, sector uh, these days. This can actually achieve about uh, more than 10,000 orders delivered daily on a daily basis. And the other good advantage is that it actually eliminates or you know, make your, your people actually more productive. Eliminate about two thirds of the picking labor and well, here comes the first one. It can actually have as little as a one to two years of a payback period. Now, over here, I would like to share one of our success uh, cases, and it's an ongoing and very successful partnership.
There's a case study I'd like to um, share even more, and this is with regards to omni-channel distribution. So this particular customer, they traditionally pick by manual um, about 49,000 orders a day. The number of labor that they need is actually about 96. Upon the deployment of a Kit Plus robotic solution, same number of orders, 49,000. The labor has become more productive. Uh, it has now been reduced to 26 with a, a, a total deployment of uh, 104 robots. Now, the interesting thing is this. The same customer, 49,000 a day, number of labor, 26, number of robots, 104. So during this year, when COVID actually hits, uh, some of you or some of the businesses might uh, be aware of, there was actually a sudden surge of orders per day, increasing to, for this particular customer, increased by about 50% to 73,500 orders. Labor increased, yes, uh, from 26 to 35. Number of uh, robots deployed was an uh, addition of 36. And this was actually implemented in a very, very short period of time because it was a surge in demand. So this one big advantage or one main advantage of user, using an AMR or robotic solution. Um, here comes the ROI calculation. This is an example of uh, one of our UK retailer. So before that, they were having about 96 uh, employees. And after the deployment of Git Plus solution uh, using robots, uh, which is our picking series, the number of employees reduced down to 26. And the annual savings is 1.75 million pounds. And this translates to an ROI of 1.9 years. So this is uh, another thing about using an AMR. It's very different from the traditional type of uh, automated solutions that we are aware of, where the payback period is probably much longer and larger. Now, one reason why we can actually have such a high throughput using the robots is because we utilize a lot of uh, artificial intelligence. And with artificial intelligence, we actually have machine learning that's embedded into the system. Over here on this slide, um, this is one of our optimization strategy. Over here on this slide, this is a method we call the heat wave method, the heat method. Uh, method. Now on the left hand side, you see the racks. These are all the movable racks categorized by the different colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and darker blue. Now what this means is actually the red zone is actually where all the fast moving goods are on the racks. Now on the right hand side, you see a simulation that we had done in a particular project. The little black dots are running, they are actually robots. So at all times of the day, all the robots are actually working, moving rackings from the slower moving to the faster moving, and all in the hope of optimizing the operations. So this is one big advantage of using the robotic solution which enables this to happen. Now, when the fast moving racks are near the workstation, it actually translates to a faster time for the racks with the items that is needed to come to the workstation, hence increasing the productivity. This is the next group of uh, robots I would like to share. This is uh, the sorting robots. And in terms of sorting robots, um, the customers that actually use this would mainly be in the post and parcel industry um, where you have a huge number of orders coming in and you have many, many destinations to sort to. So customers like a VIP.com, e-commerce retailer. Um, we even have uh, customers who are actually in the library and also in Russia, for example, in Nissa. The type of sorting robots that we have is quite a good variety. Catering from the S10 series, which can uh, cater up to uh, as, as a light as an 8 kg, all right, uh, with 200 by 200 by 200 count of dimensions, all the way up to 100 kg with the S100C series. So we have a wide range of uh, robots uh, that is used for the sorting purpose. Now, you can see that we have the mini sort, the mini sort system. This is very good for anything that is a throughput that's up to about 3000 parcels per hour or PPH. We have the fleet sort, which is for a much larger kind of uh, setup, probably about 7,500 to 9,000 parcels per hour. And then we also cater for customers who have a very tight constraint on their footprint, which is known as a mezzanine sorting. Now, in this case, what we do is we have a mezzanine floor. The sortation process takes place on the mezzanine floor and the destinations are actually bottom. So we call this the mezzanine sorting. Some videos here. Above, we have the 3 PL application. On the right-hand side, it's actually the mezzanine sorting, the one of the Express Center, uh, one of our, our reference. 
So this is a mezzanine level where the saltation takes place. You can see all this orange color, these are actually the chutes. So this is known as the conveying method where the items are actually dropped in the chutes at the bottom where these are the destinations. There was uh, an article or a video that was done, which can be seen over here on the bottom left, which is, uh, it, it was a, a library uh, application that actually compares the difference between manual sort and an automated sortation. So it was carried out, uh, I think it was also you know, one of the entertainment channels it was actually presented. So after the sortation ends, basically it was actually found that robotic sortation is about 10 times more efficient than manual sort. Going to our next category of our robot, which is known as the moving robot. This type of uh, moving robots is uh, particularly very, very useful for factory applications or manufacturing applications. So customers which actually use this are typically like, uh, for example, uh, in automotive industry, in, 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 uh, in uh, some other uh, manufacturing industry, that is actually one of them also. So these are some examples. What's so different and so good about a moving robot is the fact that it enables a slam navigation. Now, what is slam navigation? Should it shame we think that AGVs or shuttle vehicles are moving on racks or, or, or trails, and these are actually embedded on the ground. Now, with the new technology currently in the market, we can actually do a slam navigation where navigation takes place with uh, LIDAR. And so, as you can see in this video, the robots are actually moving all around. There's actually no fixed path. It actually finds the shortest path for it to reach its objective, hence increasing productivity. So this actually allows um, the robot to actually work with a hu in a, with human in a collaborating method. Going on to all the other possible purposes, and these are all real life cases, we have the pallet moving where the robots can be fitted with a pallet. And this pallet can be uh, a, an euro size, one meter by 1.2 meters with a 600, with a, let's say about one meters high kind of uh, load. It can take up to about 1.2 to 1.3 tons, not an issue. It actually can also uh, interface with conveyors with uh, maybe your, you have the ASRS system, your mini load system. On the right hand side, we have the kitsch trolley. So this is, uh, as you can see, it actually carries the, the trays or the trolleys with items in it from point to point. Conveyor type. So the robot is actually fitted with a conveyor top. So you can actually do input and output and transfers. Moving of racks. And lastly, the video on the bottom right is actually showing a production line and how it interfaces a production line. Now, in this particular customer of ours, they are actually using the moving robots fitted with a table and then they put bins and totes above. So they will go from station to station. And this actually increases the productivity as well. This particular category of uh, robot we are very, very proud of. In fact, this year we actually launched, uh, a, a, let's say, an improved version of the robot, which is actually known as our Robo Shutter series. And I would love to be able to share more by means of a video. So that is actually our robot shutter uh, robots. 
And as you can see from the video, it's, it's really, really good. And I believe that a lot of you can actually find usage for it. Um, the one of the main reason why we actually develop it is because we want to bring a robotic solution to a warehouse. We understand the constraints of a warehouse, which can be maybe a very low ceiling, five meters, six meters, eight meters. And uh, in this case, it can actually carry up to uh, five bins. That's our C200M. Uh, C200M. And the, it's actually certified with uh, CE and the working temperature again. Uh, interesting, not so interestingly, but we have made sure that the working temperature can be also be used, used in a cold store environment. So this is our Robo Shutter um, C200S and the recently launched C200M. We have catered using our robots from the baking to the moving to a very wide variety of customers, ranging from Nike Decathlon, which is the, 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 the fashion, the apparel. Um, we have the, even Disney. We have also catered to the big uh, logistic players, um, DHL, Siva, DSV, YCH. We have um, done even all the way up to um, for grocery, for example, Walmart, Computer Parts, um, Dell, DJI, the drone company, and also all the e-commerce uh, firms um, like uh, Tmall and VIP.com, amongst many others. So you can see that the usage of robots is not restricted to any particular industry, but it's actually a very, very wide uh, kind of usage. Geek Plus, uh, we have set up for about six years now, six, seven years. And we are also proud that we have won uh, a couple of awards along the way. The most recent being recognized as one of the top 50 robotic companies in the world, um, which is right over here. And we are the only company that has won it uh, two years in a row. So this is something that we are basically proud of because it's a testament that uh, we are actually going on the right track. And we, and we want to continue to do so. The Geek Plus robotic solution is made such that we want business or we hope to have businesses of any scale, be it can be a small, medium or large, that can access AMR solutions. So therefore, because of that, um, besides the purchasing kind of uh, arrangement, we also have flexible lease plans. And this actually helps to reduce your initial or even eliminate your initial capital investment. Now, on top of that, we have robots as a service or we call it the RAS. So this actually means it's a robot rental for peak period. So now what this translates to is that uh, maybe from the month of um, January to, to September, you probably need only, let's say, about 1,000, right? And then when it comes Christmas season, I just use one season, uh, like in Philippines, no, that Christmas starts in, uh, in September. That was what I was told. And you need to ramp up, right? But you don't want to, to you need to ramp up so you do not know what to do. So in this case, robot as a service allows you to rent the additional robots to temporarily increase your demand to cater for that search. And then after the search ends, you can actually return back to us. So that is what an AMR solution is all about and a robotic solution is able to do. So to summarize, basically, um, what I'd like to share is one to three years ROI is definitely possible. So that will answer probably about uh, initially about 57% of you. Uh, of the audience here who thinks uh, they want to know about cost, right? So one to three years ROI is definitely possible. Efficiency is definitely 100% guaranteed very high. Two to 300% at least, definitely. Accuracy is 99.99% because this is all run by softwares, right? So everything is quite pinpoint, very, very uh, accurate. And then the other thing is that the robotic solution has a very short implementation time. It's a very simple on-site installation and commissioning without any ground fixing. So what this means is easy to set up, it's easy to scale up, it's also very easy to move from a place to another place. One to three months is basically that's about the average time depending on size of project. Um, I know that also because in Singapore recently, we took less than a month to set and get a commission a particular project. Okay, so that is that, and this is during COVID. So with that, um, I would like to kick off another poll question. Uh, similarly, if you can, please take 15 minutes, uh, 15 seconds at a time to uh, just answer and 15 seconds later, I will uh, reply. I will show the results. We will show the results. So what are the challenges faced with COVID-19 and the resultant safety measures kicking in? So I think this is uh, something that touched all of us.
okay, sudden changes in volume and business activities being 70%. And then the other one is workforce disruption, which I myself also selected workforce disruption. That's true. I mean, we have been in COVID uh, in Singapore where I'm based. It has been about uh, three, eight, five months, going on six months now. All right, in other parts of the world where you come from, it's probably the same. The whole world is being affected. So, what I would like to share next is that, oops, okay. In response to the COVID situation, we are also using our expertise in robots to basically to do our part, all right, which is known as our disinfection robot. I'd like to share a video. So introducing Lavender, this is our Geek Plus um, disinfection robot, uh, uses a UV light and it, it has everything that, uh, that uh, we are offering, which is, which is basically the, the, the fact that you can uh, kill 99% of, of the germs. Automation 24 7 is possible, it allows regular and systematic disinfection, guaranteeing comprehensive scanning, operating in very, very complex environments, and it also comes incorporated with multi-sensors to detect objects for uh, safety. We have already um, deployed and used in a wide uh, number of places and, uh, and functions, as you can see from pictures here. Um, from the warehouse to the airport hotels, uh, if you can recognize this, actually a Changi Airport, clinics, restaurant office, office building, beauty salons, um, Dr. Reborn, and then also we have shopping mall and retail store. So these are all the different places where the disinfection robots are, are actually have really been operated in and can be used in. So thank you very much um, for allowing me to share. I hope you have a, a, a getting a, uh, an idea of uh, how the uh, our solution is and the applications that the robotic solution or AMR solutions can assist you in your operation. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you, Alvin. Um, and for the audience, I'd like to highlight that uh, there will be some white papers from uh, Git Plus for downloading towards the end of this, uh, of this webinar. So please do stick around. We're moving quickly on to the next segment. Uh, please welcome Kato-san from ACCA International joining us from Japan, and uh, Ryan Yap from YCH in Singapore. Hi. Um, okay. So uh, yeah. yeah, in this session, uh, we're glad to invite yeah, to um, uh, offer our Git Plus business partner um, to share the experience of using robotic automation and the work with Git Plus. Um, so, um, yeah, Mr. Uh, Hiro Kato-san um, uh, from ACCA International Japan, who working with us since 2017, and also Mr. Ryan Yap, 
from YCH Group, group Singapore, who started the relationship with G Plus last year. So hello, uh, Kyle-san and Ryan. Yeah, and thank you for being our uh, guest speaker. So let's uh, let's our audience know more about your company first. Maybe, yeah, Kato-san, you briefly introduce your company. Yes, uh, thank you, Lit. Um, my name is Hiro. I'm from Aka International, uh, based in Japan. Aka International provides fulfillment services for um, Japan. And we have logistics, system development, uh, call centers, photo studios, and all the uh, facilities needed for e-commerce operators. And we create a tailor-made solution for each customers, uh, including the AGV uh, we use today. And I would like to share uh, our working um, environment with you today, uh, which is Nike, our key customer. And we have approval to show this um, operation. Uh, so just hold on a second. Sorry, I'll just hold on. Do you see the screen? No? No, sorry. I'll just show it again. Hold on a second. Uh, no, Kato san, um, yep. just seeing you, cannot see the screen yet. Okay, I'll yeah. just show it again. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just hold on a second. It's this. Did you see it now? Ah, okay. yes, yes. Perfect. Okay, this is the Nike facility that uh, we are operating here in Japan. And Nike operation is based on the direct to consumer piece. So we uh, focus on the dot com, the digital business, e commerce, and the, their flagship stores, uh, Nike stores uh, operations. So, as for this center, uh, we have over 200 Geek Plus's robots uh, with uh, 7,000 racks. And a normal operation day, we have 30,000 uh, units. Uh, per day uh, dispatch and on the peak are uh, 40 to uh, 50,000 K uh, for the dispatch uh, outbound operations. So um, here's just one example, but we have five other um, distribution centers like this uh, in Japan uh, to, to serve our, our customers. So this is um, just a brief explanation of our services thank you okay okay yeah thank you um uh, kato san and how about ryan can you briefly introduce your company to our audience i right, sure happy to do so thanks Lid. uh so uh, ych we uh we pride ourselves as being the largest uh, singapore homegrown supply chain company uh, we we've always uh a lot of people call us 3pl but we take offense to that uh, we call ourselves 7pl uh, it's something we trademark. And the idea is that we don't just execute, which is the typical 3PL role. We also advise, uh, which is why we call ourselves 7PL, because uh, we believe that our service is actually a fourth-party logistics combined with the third-party logistics. And uh, we don't only tell you what to do. We are actually a commit on what we say uh, and uh, based on that handshake. Right, and uh, for us, our footprint is uh, primarily Asia. Uh, we, we, we believe Asia is our playground and we, cho we choose to uh, keep the focus uh, within growth markets. Uh, that's where we see this uh, highest complexity and the greatest niche for us. And the idea for us is uh, for logistics as a whole is that there are three flows, uh, physical, information, and financial. And our, our vision is actually to be the key connector and build that logistics superhighway uh, of seamless connectivity. And uh, for us, I think uh, just a quick reason on why we are here is uh, we've always believed that innovation is key. Uh, innovation to survive is in our DNA. Uh, we've actually uh, no stranger to disruption uh, because in the 70s, we, were, we started out as a transport company. Uh, we were disrupted by a Singapore bus service. So there goes our entire business model. And uh, we actually had to innovate to change from where we were, a passenger transport to a supply chain company. So that took uh, a lot of... Uh, a lot of guts and a lot of uh, determination, uh, as well as a willingness to take risks. I think that has served us well throughout today. 
and which is why we decided to partner uh, with Geek Plus and uh, look at innovation and perhaps share a little bit on our innovation journey because uh, that's something that we believe is uh, key for all companies, especially in this pandemic age. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, so another question is, uh, I wanted to ask uh, both of you guys. Okay, uh, what is the supply chain trend you foresee in your country? Um, yeah, we, we can have a Japan uh, perspective and Singapore perspective perspective. So Kamsan, what is the trend you foresee? Yeah. yeah, trend in Japan is really focusing on e-commerce and direct to consumer. And demand has increased rapidly after the COVID-19 situation. And we've extended our operation hours to 24 hours, uh, seven days a week. And it's nonstop operation. But we are still, you know, keeping our capacity up and up, uh, just st stretch ourselves. And omni-channel driven market is pushing the third third party logistics to more technology uh, system um, uh, boundaries. So we cannot just focus on operation, but we need to be tech company to be able to survive and also fulfill our customers' needs. So the company is experiencing rapid change. So is the market. Okay, so how about Ryan in Singapore? Yeah. I feel I don't need to answer the question because Kato has given all the answers already. <laughs> uh, but I think in Singapore, we have a, uh, we're not as developed as Japan, uh, um, uh, unfortunately or unfortunately. And what we find right now in Singapore is that you have a dichotomy of the traditional uh, retail as well as the new retail models. And uh, we believe that together with, I mean, the pandemic age and the speed at which our retail associations and our uh, trade industry uh, associations actually run, there is going to be a reshaping of, of the of demand, right? To focus more on omnichannel. So which is why I probably said Kato is a, uh, Kato has really capably answered everything. But I think there will be a unique Singapore approach because shopping malls do form a very large part of Singapore's infrastructure. And uh, those will not be going away anytime soon. Too much money has gone into there. But the it will probably be a, a big mix of uh, not just shopping online or not just uh, shopping offline. It's likely to be something where we where we see that people are ordering anywhere, not just at home on the phone, in the store itself, while queuing up to buy food, these are things that we will see. So the demand hits will, be, will increase rapidly uh, in Singapore, uh, as opposed to uh, traditional where you have cut off times, where you can say deliver the next day. These are, are unlikely to exist moving forward. Yeah, I find there's a two wordings from 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 different from from two country. One is the uh, omnichannel, another is uh, survive. Okay, how to survive using the automation in warehouse? How you help uh, uh, lower the operation costs, make the flexible warehouses will be the critical point in in this two country lah. Okay, at least okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, interestingly. I think one of the most uh, pertinent questions that will be asked by most of the audience here is actually a move between, uh, from the tradition to the automation side. All right, so uh, maybe I should direct this uh, first. Um, but the question would be, what is it that actually kind of, uh, what was the push factor or the, or, or the pain points that actually um, makes you want to move towards automation? Um, perhaps maybe Ryan, um, you might, might want to tackle that question first. Sure. I think for, for us, there are a number of pain points. Uh, let, let's just go in order. I think there's a, there's a need to look more advanced. Right? There's also, uh, I think, a bit of, that's the pull factor. There's a bit of push factor because the entire supply chain industry, as we said earlier, is starting to go more online. So your traditional models of pallet in, pallet out, or even carton in, carton out, that, that starts to go down uh, uh, like nobody's business. And yeah. if you don't, and that's something we we hit upon quite early. So we actually uh, took pains to build up our e-commerce capabilities, I think from about three, four, five, even five, actually five years ago, 2015. And uh, the missing piece for us was the automation, right? Because we traditionally focus on the IT and the domain knowledge which we have. We have our own IT uh, company that builds our supply chain solutions, but not being a automation partner, it was a bit difficult to make that journey. So uh, I, th I think uh, it's a combination of pain points, but I think the main reason is really survival. Uh, people want these services and you cannot stop them. 
mm. as, and I honestly don't think it behooves us to stop there because it, you can't stifle it. You can't stifle change. You have to adapt with it. Yeah. Thank mm. you, Ryan. Well, Kato san, same question to you as well. Yeah. What was the reason uh, for you to choose automation over manual? For example, you just, you're just sharing with us um, uh, your project uh, uh, video in Nike. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Kato san, yes. Yeah. Uh, the reason why we shifted to automation is that the the labor force um, cost is rising rapidly, and also the labor shortage is severe problem in uh, logistics market. So it's um, we cannot hire enough people to to fulfill our services, and also um, automation. Um, it's it's a tool that um, Geek Plus uh, provides us, and it's really up to us how to use it uh, in the effect, most, ef most effective way that our customer would benefit. So it's not really the hardware that, that, that causes a problem, but it's the system. So we need to fine tune the system so that uh, we can adapt our tools and solution uh, for each customers that uses us uh, in you know all the unique ways. So if there is ten customers, there are ten ways that uh, they want to use it. So we need to you know answer to our customers. And also, automation is a teamwork. So we use picking system from Geek Plus, but you know there is. Um, work be before the picking and after the picking. So in order to automate the most efficient process, uh, we need to design the, the process uh, with different modules of solutions combined together to create the most value, such as RFID, we are working on it. So, you know, working closely with RFID, Geek Plus, combine together, see what happens. You know, we need to do this every day to, to get the, the right balance. Yep. Well, thank you for, uh, for sharing. That was very, very insightful as well. Um, thank you, Ryan. Yeah, so, so I think, um, yeah, um, I think most of the audience uh, wish to know, okay, more about ACCA, Aka, the successful case in Japan. Um, since we are in long-term relationship, we, we probably, we already have uh, five projects in Japan with Aka, ACCA already. So what's make ACCA, you, you decide to replicate the project and work with Geek Plus continuously? Hello, can you share uh, some, some of the key factor? Yeah, um, I think the success is really based on the desperate client's needs. So clients cannot wait for solutions. I mean, as Ryan said, uh, the need is there and people cannot wait. So with that very strong driving force, uh, you know, because of that, uh, we were able to grow with our client with uh, the right um, product or solution from Geek Plus. And I think the, the physical advantage that Geek Plus has provided us is um, they've actually built a uh, branch or headquarter in Japan to support the Japanese market. So the audience or the client of Geek Plus knows that the commitment of Geek Plus to the market. So we are very com comfortable and confident to, to support the solution uh, with G Geek Plus uh, here in Japan. And they've released 24 hours uh, call centers, care center, and uh, consultation services for each client of ours. And those um, very heavy uh, supporting body uh, are there to, you know, lead us to success. So those are the main drivers. Yeah, desperate clients with a strong, uh, caring uh, Geek Plus yeah, support. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you for advertising and uh, selling to give us. Yeah, thank you. But anyway, I think this uh, uh, ACA is very 
uh, benefit for GIPAS as well, because, you know, for our product development as well, you know, we work with um, uh, ACA for a few projects. And then, you know, in Japan, the industrial standard, the service standard, is a really, really extremely high compared with different country. So this is also benefit for us as well. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Kano san. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, maybe how about Ryan? Uh, uh, how you feel the role of the robot would play in supply chain industry going forward? Sure. Um, I think there's a bit of a fortune telling that that happens in Singapore because we can look at the more established economies like Japan to figure out what's going to happen to us, uh, for better or for worse. Because uh, a a good point you touched upon is the difficulty of finding labor. It's not a question of do I want to hire or not. It's even if I want to pay the market rate, I cannot find the people that I need. Uh, primarily because uh, I think there are. I shouldn't be saying this, but there are sexier industries than supply chain. It's traditionally viewed as laborious, not so interesting, and uh, doesn't pay very well. Uh, I would refute, rebut all of those presumptions, but that is the market sentiment. And so for us, the, the robotics are, don't just come in to solve the manpower crunch, but they also come in to boost the image of the industry, which I find is extremely key because you're looking at, oh, this, you, you show this to the students even, and they're so impressed because they're like, oh, supply chain can be really interesting and fun and very cutting edge. I think that's something that is uh, uh, something well, beyond what Kato-san has already mentioned, right? I think that's a, a hidden benefit that will uh, be very useful for the industry as a whole uh, by working with robotics and innovative companies such as Geek Plus. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally agree with Ryan. Okay, so maybe I, I jump into uh, the next question because there's a lot of audience asking about the implementation. Okay, so maybe you you are you are very good to share your your experience, uh, Okay, so what is the difficulties to facing during the uh, process of implementation of automation? Yeah, maybe Katosan. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's not really the hardware uh, which is difficult to implement. Um, when we get the shelves and robots and working station, charging stations, it takes about a week or two to set it up and test it and launch it. Um, not probably, you know, after the, the arrival, it takes about a month, uh, then the full, uh, reoperation happens. But on the other side, uh, there's a system issue. And um, Geek Plus offers a very variety of uh, different settings for the entire system. So basically we need to look into our customers, um, the, uh, the operation or needs uh, to use the, the solution. So um, two big um, options that Geek Plus offers, uh, one is clear location and the other one is minimum tasks. So these two settings are there to, to, to maximize the, the productivity of the entire solution. But if you make wrong choice of these options or system settings, the robots or the entire solution doesn't work as much as uh, you, you should do. So the designing of this system setting is a key issue for implementation, I would say, I would, I would say after you know, implementing five different sites. Okay, so how about Ryan? I think for us, uh, it's actually, uh, really share a lot of similar sentiments with uh, Kato Sound actually. The physical part was very quick. Uh, it's it's not, not something that we expect. We're very pleasantly surprised because um, we've done uh, We've done automations before and they typically would take at least six months, uh, depending on what you're doing, to get it off the ground. Uh, I think we actually finished our e-commerce uh, center of excellence in Singapore uh, with Geek Plus. I think that took three weeks actually to, to do up the floor. I mean, it's not as large as, as Kato San's uh, very impressive Nike facility. Uh, when you look at 24 robots, I think it's about... Uh, 
8,000, 10,000 square feet. So a lot smaller, but, but the, the level of attention to detail is still there. Uh, and the, the ease of implementation was there. So hardware, not really our concern. It's, it's really the system because a, a big part of it, I think, plus and minus is our systems are proprietary to us. So there are no established APIs existing out there to connect with our systems. If there are, I'd be concerned, uh, but, uh, but there were, there, there were not, so I don't have to be too concerned. So a lot of time was actually spent before the implementation, actually mapping and remapping each other's uh, uh, architectures to, to, to match up, right? As well as uh, very clearly defining, okay, this is, uh, this is my domain knowledge, right? So uh, uh, for example, uh, order orchestration and uh, load management, as well as perhaps certain zoning requirements that is di uh, dictated by our system. Whereas uh, Geek Plus's uh, strengths are in the good person picking methodologies, the, the, the picking rate uh, optimizations, the hit rate optimizations, and we leave that split and so that each party can focus on their strengths. So that part was tough to work out, but once we did, uh, I think it's a matter of, um, I think the Chinese saying, Tai Sang, San Fen Zong, Tai Xia, Shi Nian Gong. Three minutes on stage, 10 years off stage practicing. Right? So that is uh, how we had to do the implementation. But the benefits have paid off so far, smoothest implementation uh, to date in, in YCH's uh, 65 year history. Uh, and uh, and uh, it's just a matter of putting in the hard work early. First bitter, then sweet. Mm, okay, okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, I think um, this is uh, accumulated by our experience uh, for uh, for this couple of years. We sold uh, over 10,000 robots, over 300 projects, and then we accumulate and standardize every procedure for hardware, software, uh, integration, document, project management as well. So uh, that would be very easy to do the deployment. Like I say, as Ryan said, it's around three weeks for the on-site installation. This is quite typical case uh, in, in our experience. Uh, yeah. So um, I'll come to the last question. Uh, I'd like to, uh, again, the same question, but uh, maybe Katosa can answer first. That is, uh, I make it more generic. What is uh, ACCA's uh, company future plan maybe for the next five, 10 years? And do you think that robots or robotic solution will play a part in it? Mm. I think um, with the solution that Geek Plus provides, um, the entire industry can be changed. Um, with a Nike situation, uh, there were eight other competitors uh, for the job and we won it, but we were the far smallest out of all eight um, competitors. They were massive 3PLs, um, you know, besides us uh, for the job. But the reason why we won the deal was that it's the game change. You know, we can be really flexible and creative to change the market and drive it in the way that our clients really needs. So now, you know, because of those solutions, it's possible that small companies like us uh, can really win the deals of a lifetime. And we would like to do cloud fulfillment in near future. Uh, cloud fulfillment means connecting warehouse spaces, solution, system, all the material handling gears. Uh, it's like a cloud uh, um, database. You know, it's not just a single warehouse operating. And when the business grows, you know, you move to a bigger one, then bigger one, bigger one. And it just doesn't make sense anymore. And the, the growth rate is much higher. Uh, needs flexibility, you know, you don't, you don't need to spend so much money on, um, you know, capital expenditure. Uh, you know, nowadays, you know, everything is sus subscribed. So warehousing or logistics or fulfillment services can be like that too. So we are planning to connect each of those elements together so that or 3PL or logistics industry can share the knowledge and you know working power to support the industry or support the clients of needs. So that's the the future plan, and that is uh, moving forward 
every day now in our in a company and also our parent company is a big um, constructor a Daiwa house group and they build warehouses and solutions to our customers too so with them helping us um, you know this is becoming a big movement and you know Daiwa house is a developer and developer has you know various different competitors but you know it's not really com competing against each other but cooperate to form a network so everyone uh, every user can benefit out of those uh, network and that that network is possible because of the solution coming into the market for us to use yeah. Wow, that's a good ecosystem. <laughs> mm. um, Ryan, so how about yourself? What is the uh, YCH company plan uh, for the next 5-10 years? And how do you think uh, robotics automation, uh, do you think it's going to play a part in your growth? Sure, I think for, for YCH, our path is quite clear. I mean, uh, the vision stays the same. We want to be that, we want to bring that logistics superhighway to all our customers. And uh, uh, actually, it's really similar. I think, Kato san and I, we, we need to have a, a, a longer talk uh, in more detail. <laughs> but uh, we, we actually foresee the, the same issues of, of the typical logistics industry. I mean, for us, the enemy is not each other. The enemy is inefficiency, this nebulous concept of wastage. Right? And, and uh, typically, what we see in warehousing is uh, the ability to guess right or wrong uh, is something that is crucial uh, because you're looking at uh, you know just in time or trying to have as little excess or, or understock as possible. That that is really the game of supply chain. So we're looking into building predictive models. Uh, we're looking at flexible warehousing. Uh, how do you make uh, the most out of a, of a certain area such that you can just shove more and more cargo into this? And this is not an, this is not a new concept but the way we are going about it is new. Previously, how we would do it is you have very experienced forklift drivers with fantastic memory banks who doesn't need any WMS or system, not even pen and paper. They know where they've squirreled things away into the warehouse such that you have 120%, 130% capacity instead of 100 on, on, on the seasonal peaks because these are very experienced people. So the Chinese would say they use Kang Hu, use Kung Fu, right, to, to manage this which is domain knowledge. So for us, the, the approach is distilling this domain knowledge and putting something concrete behind it. So the building behind me, my virtual background is actually our patented facility fusion areas. We've actually combined the ASRS with the, well, okay, traditional in Singapore anyways, ramp up warehouse at every single floor. The idea is I can turn any of my five traditional ramp up floors into geek plus kind of uh, um, areas for to really ramp up the productivity. Uh, I use my ASRS for the standard ASRS. I use it as a black box, which is where the access space will go to because I have about eight times land productivity for, for the ASRS portion as compared to the ramp up area. So I have some flexibility on the ramp up, but I have huge scalability on the ASRS. So we're, we're looking into building more of these areas and we find Geek Plus uh, moving forward is actually going to be a very key enabler on on building upon this, this uh, uh, methodology of uh, creating something out of nothing. I think that, that is really the, the, the ethos we have moving forward. Uh, another area is the network that we have because we're Asia focused. So we, we may seem to be not as spread as other people. And that's correct because our strategy is to be, to go deep into the countries that we're in. We're in 14 countries, which is not a lot on a global scale. But the depth of, of uh, where we are in these 14 countries is where we look to offer value. And of course, imagine if we have uh, these, uh, few, uh, these fusion ice facilities across every single footprint, that level of scalability, the ability to shift cross-border because these are all privately owned uh, assets, right? That is something that we can bring to our customers that I think the traditional, sorry, the existing big boys may not be able to, not say they can't, but it'll be tougher because uh, thankfully we are a private company. So this is just my inheritance money. It's okay. No problem. I'm willing <laughs> to spend it. <laughs> right. Uh, but the idea is to bring that super highway. Right? And the way to do that is to keep a very tight uh, control and network and build strong ecosystems. I think Kato and I, we should, uh, Kato San and I, we should speak more about that later. Uh, and, um, and of course, trying to increasingly make 
you know, make magic happen, make something out of nothing with uh, the, the strong foundations, right, uh, such as good facilities, uh, good systems, and very quick and agile implementation. I think that's how we will have to move uh, in, the, in the growing future. Right? And I think Geek Plus will be a very handy partner to have for us moving forward. Well, um, thank you very much. I have the good fortune of uh, knowing YCH as a big company for many, many years, actually. Uh, I'm also Singaporean. And I particularly am very, very glad that actually sometime in November, we are going to have a partnership together for uh, an innovation center in Singapore that is in Supply Chain City. And I extend this invitation to all the audience over here. And this is where uh, together with YCH, we'll be showing the whole Geek Plus um, robotic solution in, uh, with uh, the uh, YCH uh, um, um, participation and also support. All right, so um, in November, we'll be having a 9,000 square, I think it's about 9,000 square feet. It's actually our first, first uh, innovation hub outside of uh, in China, and that will be actually in Singapore. And that's in partnership with YCH. So thank you, Ryan. And thank you, no Kato Sabu. Please, please, everyone come down and see. Perhaps Kato <laughs> we can we can send you a link as well. <laughs> I'll provide the mask. <laughs> okay, so. Love to see it. So, um, so right, just, so uh, we turn back to... Yes, I think, uh, thank you, Alvin. Thank you, Lid, uh, Ryan, and uh, Kato-san. Very engaging conversation there. Um, and whilst uh, you guys were exchanging views and sharing insights, I think our audience has come in with uh, quite a few questions. Uh, good thing we have uh, about half an hour, so let's uh, spend some time and uh, address them. Uh, I noted that uh, Lit has actually industriously um, answered some of the questions, but uh, I think we can start with the open ones, right? Uh, one of the top voted open questions is uh, actually directed at our guests, uh, Mr. Katosan and uh, Ryan. Um, does automating your operation result in less employment of ground workers? Or maybe to rephrase the question, what, what is the uh, manpower savings dividend that you have experienced uh, implementing automation solutions like Take Plus? Okay, for our Nike facility, uh, we have about 50 to 70 workers, operators in the facility, and we are dispatching around 30,000 units per day. If we are not using Geek Plus solution, uh, we would probably need over 200 people. Yeah. And, you know, that's the the fact that we are facing and i think for employment i don't think um any automation would kill uh employment because you know without any automation i don't think uh logistic service would survive as ryan said and you know we need to work together uh to create create solution. So automation on one hand and the other hand, human working together, you know, each has e different values, you know, so we really need to work together uh, to, to cooperate, I think. Ryan, I think I uh, uh, completely sorry. agree. Uh, sorry, James. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I completely agree with Kato-san. Uh, actually, it, it, it's not a matter of are there less employees or more employees. It's do I even have the job in the first place? Uh, I think that is the, the, the base consideration because look, a company, at least for us, YCH, we are a family company. We have been for three generations and uh, we treat our employees like family. And, and to us, it's if the family doesn't do well as a whole, I think there's no point fighting over what, what money there is because there, there just simply isn't any. Right. And for us, it's a matter of how do I make everyone successful? So it's not an employer versus employee situation. It's what do we do as YCH vis-a-vis uh, -vis the world. And uh, without these uh, automations, it's, uh, well, yes, I will have to hire more people, but it doesn't mean I can win the contract at all. And, um, and, and neither is it sustainable in the long term because 
you're looking at things like aging population, uh, we're looking at trying to be more inclusive, uh, even uh, handling you know, various disabilities. And we find with robotics, uh, with the goods to person methodology, I'm able to retain my employees actually who are getting older. Uh, I, can, I, don't have to, uh, I don't necessarily have to rely on physical traits, which allows me to hire handy capable workers uh, or to keep my handy capable workers. I can hire more women uh, in the warehouse because uh, traditionally it's a lot of walking. It's a lot of uh, relatively heavy uh, uh, carters or, or you know, that, that you have to maneuver and uh, that actually shrinks my pool of available employees at least in Singapore. So with these robotics you actually level the playing field for older workers, for female workers, for handy capable workers. I think uh, so, so it's not a matter of am I hiring less, I'm actually widening my net to hire more. So yes each individual operation will use less people but I get more operations to run and I have a wider net from where I can hire. Uh, from and those players, uh, those uh, employees who are actually, you know, the ideal employee, uh, so to speak, I mean, not this ideal, but the easier to employ employees, they can, they, they are freed up to work for the other players, whereas I can take in those that may not be, uh, you know, typically as employable, right? And so I think that is overall good for the whole industry. Well, thank you both uh, for very thoughtful answers to a question that could be sensitive uh, in the current climate, and I totally agree with you. I think the debate whether automation replaces uh, labor, uh, I think people don't see the upside and thank you for your very thoughtful responses. Uh, moving on down to the next question, I think this is a broad question and uh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, Lit or, or Elvin or in fact uh, Kato-san and, and Ryan could chime in as well. How does risk management in the supply chain evolve when shifting from a manual to automated solution? I think uh, you know, the kind of risks that you undertake during this process. Perhaps Lip can go first. Um, yeah, for me, um, I will say probably it's the education for the attitude for the worker. Yeah, uh, because you know, there's uh, some, they, they will feel not feeling good to using automation. That means, oh, so maybe if my boss will find me or find my colleague, right? And also they, they, they happen to, to to, to the facility for maybe like over 10 years, 20 years to walking through around in the warehouse, doing the manual picking, uh, lifting up the heavy carton, pilot jack, you know. So they, they, they used to doing like this uh, for 20 years. But for the education, we need to yeah, do more before you launch the system. You, know, you, you need to tell them uh, what is the uh, ping pong right now you, you, have, you are getting right now and your productivity is, is majority is walking in the warehouse six hours per day. <laughs> yeah, so th this type of education, I, I, I think this is quite important when you decide to go for automation and you need to well educate your all the operator or the staff before you, 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 you make the decision for, to go for automation. I think this is the, major uh, risk for, for, for the automation. Of course, you, you, you will have a lot of risk for the downtime, for the server, IT. I think this is quite common for all kind of system, WMS system, whatever, automation or hardware and software. But, uh, the, for, but for the, uh, in terms of the typical reason, I think yeah, the education for the automation for pickers or operator is quite important. Yeah. How about your... Uh, Ryan and Kato-san. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it might be really Japan specific uh, thing, but uh, fire, fire department is really strict here in Japan. And the automation solution needs to, to co-work with fire uh, system, alert system. So not every uh, warehouse can install uh, such automation because of the, the fire department regulations. So we need to, to keep in mind that there are governmental rules that we need to follow in terms of uh, fire and also uh, there's battery inside the, the robot, uh, lithium ion battery. And you know, there is a certain quantity that we can keep in one facility. And luckily, uh, Geek Plus is um, PSE applicable battery is installed. Uh, that means you know we can install as much as we want in one facility, but you know there are types of uh, AGV that is not 
applicable for that uh, type of battery. So, you know, without knowing uh, the risks, uh, you can be breaking laws. So you need to be aware of what you're doing and, you know, try to be uh, legal, legal and, you know, do the business forward. So there are, I think, uh, rules in certain areas that you need to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Well, maybe in the interest of time, uh, let's move on to another question. Uh, well, this one is quite an easy one. Maybe the Geek Plus team can uh, address this. Can Geek Plus forklifts and other robots automate loading and unloading from trucks? Well, um, maybe I'll take a step at this. Um, the answer is yes. We do have a model that is called the F-Series, and uh, what it does is uh, basically it's an autonomous forklift, which means the forklift can actually move from point to point, picking up uh, pallets, loads, uh, from whichever height. Uh, of course, there's a certain uh, restriction, but um, it's actually manless. So it's actually a manless kind of uh, forklift operation. So loading and unloading from trucks, um, it can be discussed because there's still also some um, difficulty in actually doing that. But otherwise, within the warehouse itself, we already have a forklift that is uh, fully automated. Thanks for that, Alvin. Um, and we have a question about the RAS model. In fact, uh, I think I saw two or three. So let's address this. Um, this question is to understand more about the RAS model and specifically, how is it different between RAS and uh, the normal, I guess, purchasing model? Could uh, Alvin or Lit uh, share a bit more detail? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try this also. Now, RAS is actually stands for Robots as a Service. So what this means is, uh, you know, like software as a service, you know, the other type of uh, models out there. So likewise, you also do the same for the robots. So the main difference between uh, the robots as a service and normal model is that the normal norm, uh, model, you probably need to have uh, to pay for, let's say, 100 robots, right, to, to, for your facility. But with the Rust model, what we can do is uh, maybe 80% um, of your time, you only need like uh, 60 robots. And then when it comes to Christmas, 11-11, um, 9-9, all the major festivals where you have a sudden surge in demand, COVID is also, is also another case, uh, back in uh, March and April. And then you probably need an additional 40 robots. Now the Rust model will then come into play because you can actually rent this 40 robots, use during that period, um, fulfill your orders, make your customers happy. And then once the search comes down, end of Christmas, you can actually return the robots back to us. So it's actually like a leasing model. So this is what the Rust model is all about and it's different from the normal method of, let's say I buy 100 robots or a fixed infrastructure cost and uh, you know you have your whole chunk of money over there. So this allows uh, to shift, let's say, um, more from the KPEX towards the OPEX. So you have a good balance of KPEX and OPEX. Okay. Yeah, and also I think I'll, uh, I, I, I can make an example because, you, you know, we, we have some customer experience that uh, they are talking about if there's a peak season, you need to hire more people to cater the peak volume. Um, that's not easy. Uh, you wanted to hire the, some casual labor or part-time labor during that peak season. You need to do the bidding. You need to get a higher uh, hourly rate for, for the uh, casual labor to, to cater. It's not that easy. So that I think um, no matter you pay for the labor or you pay for the robot to cater the peak season. So that, that would be helpful for, for our customer. Yeah. Great. I think it's a great uh, flexible solution for certain classes of uh, clients. Um, the next question is uh, going back to our guests, uh, Mr. Katosan and uh, Mr. Yap. Were there any obstacles or pushbacks uh, you received when uh, initially trying to adopt uh, Gig Plus automation solution for your respective operations? Uh, I think I can I can start on this yeah. one. Um, so the the obstacles we receive, uh, I think a lot of it boils down to inertia, uh, also known as the unwillingness to change. Uh, it's a matter of not understanding what you're doing or what could be done better. I think because uh, there's a lot of pride in our industry. I think fairly so because these uh, generals have been doing this for 10, 15 years. You know, and, and they they obviously take pride in what they're doing. So if you come in and say, oh, this is a better way to do it, <coughs> excuse me, uh, some of them will have words, right? And it's, it's uh, how we overcame it was very simple. We actually just went to the data 
right? Uh, we went to the data and just get in deep and personal and find what are the issues that they're facing today because there will always be, be some uh, because there is, we, we don't believe there's a perfect solution. Even today, I think uh, the, the geek person, there will be something further down the road, perhaps uh, they, will, they wish the robot can move faster or something. But uh, it's a matter of finding out what are the issues and showing them how this actually solves what they're facing today. And of course, taking care of the obvious fears of I'm not going to retire or your people, I'm not going to retrench your people, I'm going to make them more productive. Instead of doing 10, today you can do 100, right? And that's, uh, that's how else you, am I going to pay you your bonus? <laughs> you know, if I don't raise productivity numbers, I think when you come from that angle where we're all looking at the same target, right? I think that is how we broke down the, the barriers to uh, resistance. Of course, it helps that Geek Plus has uh, so many accolades, you know, a, a robot company of the uh, top 50 robot company and, and the solution is actually proven in China. So prior to COVID, we actually flew some of them to, to China uh, uh, as well. They made a stop at Git versus factory and they were quite impressed with what they saw. And uh, seeing is believing, right? And I think that actually uh, uh, basically brought them over to the side of innovation. Yeah, and the good news now is uh, in Singapore, they can just come to YCH. Yes, exactly. Both the Innovation Centre and our e-commerce centre of excellence. <laughs> Great. Okay, uh, I think we have a question around uh, implementation. Uh, this question comes from Diana. Uh, you mentioned that turnaround time was around two to three months. Uh, does that include preparation, warehouse preparation processes? And what is involved in terms of preparing a warehouse in the implementation? I think this is for the Geek Plus team. Okay. Um, actually, I don't see the question. Which one? Um, uh, oh, it's okay. under the answer list, and I think uh, Lit actually did uh, provide some responses. But uh, maybe Alvin, you can provide a bit more context. Okay. So typically, the it's true that the turnaround time is between two to three months. That is actually from the time. Um, uh, well, we always use the word you know, from the time of contract award to the time it ends. Now, physically on site, it's going to take only about uh, four weeks. And the main reason is because there's actually not much of a fixed infrastructure that's actually needed. All we need is actually assemble the racks, uh, putting in the uh, QR codes, putting in the workstations. The robots already come as a so-called like a plug and play. We just need to power it up, turn on. And then after that, the next comes in will be the integration between the Wi-Fi, the robot, and the workstation. And this normally takes about uh, four weeks. It will not probably drag to about six to eight weeks. And in fact, in Singapore, uh, like Ryan earlier shared, if uh, you have heard, 24 robots, uh, 10,000 square feet. We actually did it in, uh, in about three, four weeks. We only did it about three, four weeks. And that is actually during COVID. You know, and during COVID, you have uh, problems with uh, getting people, right? Social distancing, all that. So even during COVID, we only take about three to four weeks for, for the kind of size. So I hope that uh, answers your, uh, your question, Diana. Yeah. And maybe also I, I, I can share one of our cases in, in China that we did. Uh, we are not setting up the new facility, but we help uh, one of our customer, ex existing customer to relocate the warehouse from, from the old warehouse to the new warehouse. It's around 3,000 meters square, but we, we, can do, we can help the customer to do the relocation within 24 hours. So you can see, you can imagine how simple it is. So we just um, prepare the Wi-Fi, um, sticking the QR code in the new warehouse in the files, and then we just stop the system, unload everything for the rag, robot, and do the transportation to the new warehouse, and just load it in inside and fitting it, fitting inside. So within 24 hours to do the relocation with a 3,000 meter square warehouse. So you can imagine how simple it is it. Great. Um, truly impressive. And, uh, you know, this comes back to Mr. Kato-san's earlier comment about uh, bringing cloud-like capabilities to logistics. So I think uh, with that, um, you know, we've you know, come to the end of the session. Uh, I, I know there are still some unanswered questions in the list. Uh, what we'll do is to follow up uh, subsequent to this uh, by email, uh, you know, with uh, responses from the team, if we can. And, um, you know, I would like to Right now, give me a 
Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so if you'd like to learn more about Geek Plus, uh, there's a QR code, I think now on the screen, and uh, you can scan that and uh, visit the link to download the white papers there. Do you have it? Okay. 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 And uh, that's the last poll for the day before you leave, and um, it will be good to get your responses. And be assured that a consultant from Geek Plus uh, will be reaching out to you very soon. So, Elvin, let uh, any last few words before we wrap up? Um, yeah, uh, I would say, uh, yeah, thank you, Vertex. Thank you, thank you James, um, to uh, organize the very successful uh, webinar. Although we, are, we cannot make it face to face meeting right now, but I think this is a very good chance to, to share our um, uh, experience and also uh, some cases reference to, to all the audience. Um, I think in the world, cover the Europe, cover Asia as well. And then, and also, um, yeah, thank you for investing us, uh, keep investing us to support us as, as well. And then thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Katosan, your experience, your customer voice and customer experience is very important for, for the audience as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so we've come to the end of this webinar, and uh, on behalf of the Geek, uh, Geek Plus as well as uh, the Vertex team, we'd like to thank our guest speakers, uh, and also to you, the audience, uh, for your participation, and I uh, hope you found this webinar meaningful. Uh, have a good day ahead, and uh, goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank everyone. You, thank you. Bye-bye.